the U.S. warning Russia is ready to attack. Ukrainian troops are reinforcing the border with the new American intelligence showing 80 percent of Russia's forces are in forward positions, suggesting an invasion is imminent. Two separate convoys of military equipment have been reportedly been seen moving towards Donetsk in eastern Ukraine. Russia's refusal to back down has led to further sanctions, the U.S. targeting the company behind Nord Stream 2 and its corporate officers. Speaking at the United Nations in New York, Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba urged the West to hit more and hit hard. Ukraine has never planned and does not plan any military offensive in the Donbas, neither any provocations or acts of sabotage, as Russia attacked the very fundamental principles of international peace and security. EU leaders are due to hold an emergency summit on the crisis tomorrow. Here in the UK, the Prime Minister has announced further military support for Ukraine. Boris Johnson told MPs defensive weapons will be sent to Kiev as a result of Russia's increasingly aggressive behaviour. I can announce to the House that in light of the increasingly threatening behaviour from Russia and in line with our previous support, the UK will shortly be providing a further package of military support to Ukraine. Yeah. This will include... In other news now, a rapist who carried his victim through Leeds before attacking her has been given a life sentence. Austin Asayandi was captured on CCTV walking through deserted streets with the woman in his arms in August 2015. He was only caught last September after assaulting another woman whilst working as a delivery driver. He's been jailed for life with a minimum term of 16 years. The UK is facing more bad weather with strong winds and heavy snow set to hit the UK this week. It comes after three storms battered the UK over recent days. Two severe flood warnings are still in place for the River Severn, which has now peaked. Prince Harry has launched a high court libel action against the publisher of the Daily Mail. Court papers show a claim has been made against associated newspapers, but it's not clear which title it's linked to. The Duke of Sussex is also currently bringing privacy claims against the publishers of The Sun and The Mirror. His wife, Meghan, previously won a case against associated newspapers after it reproduced parts of a letter to her estranged father, Thomas Markle. This is GB News on TV, online and DAP Plus Radio. Now it's back to Mark Stein. Hmm, Ukraine, Ukraine. Beats me. Thank you and good night. No, 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 wait. I'll, uh, I'll flesh it out a bit. The thing to bear in mind about Ukraine is that nobody pontificating on telly knows a thing about it. That's particularly true of those retired generals on US TV now serving as lobbyists and board members for the military industrial complex who've been champing at the bit since the fall of Kabul for another multi-trillion dollar two-decade sinkhole. Here at GB News, we're savvy enough to know that if you drive due east from GBHQ, you eventually hit Ukraine. After France, it's uh, Switzerland. After Switzerland, it's Austria. After Austria, it's uh, Hungary or Slovakia. And somewhere beyond that lies Lviv or Lvov. If you're appearing as a Ukraine expert on a TV panel, don't let anyone trick you by asking you how far it is from Lviv to Lvov. They're the same place. It used to be Lemberg. Uh, back when it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Whoa, whoa, put down that remote. We're not going to talk about the Austro-Hungarian Empire for the full hour, maybe just 40 minutes or so. Uh, but Ukraine is huge. It's the second largest country in Europe. Uh, it's as if after coming up with the uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia and Serbia, they ran out of names for any more small countries and just put one giant blob on the map. Uh, the word Ukraine is Slav, supposedly meaning borderland. So it's like the bit on the old medieval maps where the sharp contours start to bleed away and beyond they just write, here be dragons. In this case, here be Putin. But the point is, 
these two eastern provinces that the Kremlin has just recognised, Wosnetsk and who gives a hanks, have a combined population of four million or so. That would be more than enough for a viable country in Western Europe, Ireland, Slovenia, Lithuania. But if you recall Henry Kissinger's old complaint, who do I call if I want to call Europe? Uh, well, when Henry calls Ukraine, he certainly doesn't want to have to make six or seven calls. So instead, the two biggest countries in Europe are going to war. One is corrupt and powerful. The other is corrupt and not so powerful. And Washington, which is corrupt and useless, has decided to rattle its Raytheon and Lockheed Martin sabers because they're the most expensive sabers on the planet and rattling is all they're good for. Ever since the Austro-Hungarian Empire, whoa, whoa, put down that remote. Ever since it fell apart a century ago, there has been a vacuum in Central and Eastern Europe, a hole where a great power, or at any rate, a great regional power ought to be. And that hole gets filled with very unsavory stuff. Fascism, communism, all the fun-isms. Right now, Hungary and Romania and Slovenia and the like are inclined toward the West, toward the European Union. And they're worried that if Putin gobbles Ukraine, they risk falling back to the East. So they feel that post-Habsburg vacuum. Uh, the European Union isn't really a great power. It's a globalist regulatory agency masquerading as an empire. Russia is a resource-rich kleptocracy masquerading as an empire. But it's weak and unconvincing world orders that stumble into war over peripheral points on the map. Right now, the dead husk of a moth-eaten sock puppet that is Joe Biden is almost too literal an embodiment of a dying superpower. On the other hand, Putin looks wan and puffy, and certainly not the man he was 10 years ago. The moon stands still on a Ukrainian hill and lingers until his dreams come true. And yes, that was Gerard Depardieu and Goldie Horn and Kevin Costner all enjoying the performance. As for these last two months in Washington and London and Paris, well, as Francis General Bosquet said of the charge of the Light Brigade in the Crimea, c'est magnifique, mais ce n'est pas la guerre. Biden, Harris, Macron, Liz Truss aren't la guerre either. Mais ils ne sont pas magnifiques in the least. Let me know your thoughts. GB Views at gbnews.uk or via Twitter at GB News. And Elisabeth Moute is always magnifique, and uh, she joins us now, and we're always very glad to see her. Uh, you wrote a kind of defense of Monsieur Macron uh, today, uh, feeling that even though it was objective terms a flop, it was still credible for him to go to Moscow and sit at the other end of that 75-foot uh, table. Um, what, but did he seriously go there uh, thinking he would accomplish anything? I think he did. I think he did, because ever since he was elected president five years ago, um, he decided that part of his mandate was to do sort of big beast wrestling. And he tried to charm Donald Trump, with whom it worked to some extent. I mean, remember when Donald Trump was asking for uh, um, a, a huge military parade in Washington and his generals and defense secretary uh. were trying to tell him that it was not the American way. He got the idea from Macron, who put up a big parade on the Champs-Élysées especially for him. Uh, and Macron cultivated Putin. He went and visited Putin um, in 2018. Before that, soon after his election, he invited Putin at Versailles and had a re really sort of grandiose summit there. And when he went to St. Petersburg, he um, talked to Putin about uh, Chekhov and, and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, probably uh, more than Putin had heard for quite some time. Uh, he thinks that, you know, uh, personal relations could work, and he felt that he could try and make Putin see that it was not logical going to logically going to help Russia. And I think there was the failure of understanding from the point of view of Macron was that uh, when you're making that kind of power play, you are thinking a different way. He went twice. 
He went to Moscow in early yeah, February, no. and in early February, everybody said, uh, you know, the French once again are going it alone, and it's very decisive, and it's just telling Putin that we can't do much except talk. So this time, uh, Macron decided to, you know, he knew that the attack was imminent, and actually the attack happened. And he decided to go again, yeah. and he put Joe Biden in the loop. He put uh, uh, Boris Johnson, and believe me, I mean, the people around his staff said, look, if we put Johnson in the loop for something like this, it tells you that the situation is dire. And and he put Olaf Scholz in the yeah. loop, and, and that thing <laughs> was, was sort of coordinated, and it didn't work. Well, wait, wait, a, wait a minute here, though, because, like, in, in America... The thinking, particularly on the right, is that this whole thing, I mean, for whom the actual reality of lived life in Ukraine is fairly distant, their thinking is that this is just a massive distraction because when uh, you're not, when you're talking about foreign policy, you're not talking about how lousy uh, Biden's made everything on the domestic front. Then you have the, the, view, the point of view from Europe where... Uh, Basically, your home heating bill is going to be going through the roof. And the German calculation is that if we can blame that on uh, the cartoon villain in the Kremlin, that's better than if uh, we have to blame it on our own stupid policies in not having coal or nuclear or whatever. So there seems to be... Uh, regardless of what's happening on the ground, there's the, the idea of this as a distraction for, for restive uh, peoples in the West uh, seems, seems to have currency. Is that true in France too? You have a fairly interesting proportion of the French who actually like Putin and they do not like to have their dream shattered, mm. so they still support yeah. him and they're slightly worried. Um, but there's also something more interesting about this is that the great big fault line between Eastern Europe and Western Europe shows that when you know Western Europe has been saying that countries like Poland and Hungary didn't have our values because they were horrible reactionaries and knuckle-dragging homophobic, mm. but uh, actually those yeah. countries and the Lithuanians and the Estonians are teaching us what values should be, which is a standing firm and realizing that you know, uh, as you said earlier, uh, it's not a question of pronouns; it's a question of people getting into your country with tanks. Mm. Well, do you think, but do you think that's actually true? Those, it's no doubt in the European Union, particularly in Brussels, that they have to keep slapping down, uh, well, we call them Eastern European, but if you look at the map, it's more Middle European. Um, but uh, that we have to keep slapping them down because, as you say, they're, they're anti-immigrant. They, they, uh, they've got a slightly homophobic uh, thing about them. Putin, for example, you never need to ask him what his pronouns are. He's advertising them. He doesn't need to stick them on his Twitter feed. Um, Yet somehow then, when it comes, these people don't share our values, but we have to go to war for them. That's basically the argument, isn't it? But, I mean, already the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Estonians know that they're next. Uh, and so, and they are mm. members of NATO and they are made members of the European Union. And if you think Putin mm. is going to stop what he already wants out of Ukraine, and it's something that too many Europeans, Western Europeans have accepted, it's finlandization, which is a pretty word for a situation where you have no foreign policy, where you have Russian approved censorship on your media, uh, and uh, where nasty things happen to your politicians when, um, uh, when they don't toe the line. I mean, we know, and that is uh, actually true that there are already there have been threats by Putin of uh, uh, what he calls the guilty parties being being made to suffer. But that really means that he's actually got the kill list that Joe Biden was talking about. Uh, if you think that some, such a character, considering his country is unable to export anything manufactured uh, and except gas mm. and and oligarchs, uh, he needs the he needs the diversion, and there's no reason why he should stop. He just took one bite, and then he will take other bites. But, but yesterday, uh, for example, you're quite right about the Russian economy. Nobody, you go through your house and there's nothing that says made in Russia on the bottom of a household item other than the vodka bottle. Uh, but if you take yesterday and the day before that, Russia 
is exporting uh, whatever it is, 700,000 barrels of oil a day to the United States because the United States in its own version of this net zero thing that Germany and the UK are hot for, uh, it closed down the Keystone Pipeline. So instead of getting, uh, instead of getting its energy from Canada, uh, which is one authoritarian strongman state, it's now getting it from Russia, another authoritarian strongman state. Uh, Putin looks at this and thinks this is ridiculous. You don't, you don't go down to your local petrol station and, and threaten the guy behind the register and then he uh, and then be surprised when suddenly you can't get any petrol. I mean, basically, he's, he doesn't need products. He, he makes the one thing Europe and America needs, which is gas and oil. And because of that, he's he's sitting pretty and they're just in la la land talking about net zero. I, I don't know whether in, in America and Britain you've seen those pictures of all those generals and, and members of Putin's cabinet listening to his speech about mm. the Donbass and the Donetsk. And I thought what was really interesting is they did not look happy at all. The, I mean, they made me think of the no. uh, uh, the uh, cohorts with uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea listening to the great leader because yeah. otherwise things will happen to them. And I think Putin himself hasn't got that much of a control on a country where the life expectancy is somewhere like 60 um, and where apart from those wonderful showcases that are Moscow and Petersburg the country is in dire poverty. Hmm. Do you think war is going to spread Anne Elizabeth? I mean clearly for uh, places uh, like Poland and uh, Czechia and Bulgaria and Romania they they think this isn't going to stop in Ukraine. If he gets away with it, he's going to move west. Is that how it's seen in Paris? Yes. Uh, I think in Paris, they realize that uh, Putin also controls Germany, which is why finally, and I think Macron should get part of the credit for that, uh, Olaf Scholz, the, uh, the new uh, uh, social democrat uh, chancellor of Germany, decided to stop uh, the operations on Nord Stream 2, which is the gas pipeline uh, that Russia was mm. constructing. On the other hand, if Russia controls Ukraine, it doesn't need to build a different pipeline to not have a pipeline through Ukraine because it will be controlling Ukraine. But there's a general feeling that yeah. uh, Putin will digest those parts of Ukraine and then he'll look at Kiev and decide that what would be really nice in Kiev would be an entirely different president, like somebody who essentially rings him up whenever he has to take a decision, and that's perfectly manageable. Uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, the uh, Ukrainian president, who's been very brave in this, he's a man who flew over uh, to the Munich conference to say, uh, uh, to tell all the grandees of international defense uh, met together that mm. Ukraine will end up, would end up fighting alone. And and that was, he made me think, if you have memories of that, I mean, not personal, of the uh, Haile Selassie going to the League of Nations in Geneva in 1936 oh, yeah. uh, and help against Mussolini and of course nothing happened and that was that was something like that it was it was touching and it showed uh, things that ought to you know prompt questions in 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 Western Europe uh, it's uh, I find this um, dangerous and and worrisome for ourselves it threatens us well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? It's only a third of, of a century since communism came all the way to eastern Berlin, to Checkpoint Charlie. And we would find that very funny to think about the Russian zone, as it were, extending that far west right now. Um, but Putin doesn't think it's so funny, does he? He thinks that's actually, it was that way once and it can be that way again. And Putin himself was a KGB officer in East Germany. That's where he started his career mm. and made a kind of name. So uh, this is somebody, this yeah. is something that he's got personally living memory of it. The other thing is that he's been flooding the zone in, 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 in Russia for years, decades, about how Ukrainians are fas fascists and Nazis. Um, and uh, it's not terribly difficult to say that the Germans are fascists and Nazis because there's a Russian memory of that. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I don't yeah, think it's man. finished. It's not finished himself. No, that's uh, that's very interesting. Uh, that's true. He was the KGB guy in uh, East Germany, um, and when the uh, when the electrodes didn't work, he'd sing uh, 
I found my thrill on Blueberry Hill to them. So it all came together. It all proved very useful. Thank you, Anne Elizabeth. Coming up, digital ID. And is it time for Putin to liberate Ottawa, maybe? Plus, the Queen's former press spokesman, Dickie Arbiter. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hey, let's get to your comments. James says Putin has the measure of his main opposition, a morose, cognitively diminished grandpa and an imbecile VP uttering meaningless streams of word salad do not suffice to intimidate. We have no business in this conflict and it will end badly for us if we intervene. Look, that's the thing. You know, whoever's running the United States of America, it isn't that worthless dead husk of a moth-eaten sock puppet. It's somebody else. I don't know who it is. I'm not privy to that information. But obviously it isn't, it isn't Biden and it isn't Kamala Harris, who's a nitwit. Uh, Putin is a, a blood-soaked monster, but he's real. He's real. Uh, in the here be dragons part of the map, he's an actual real dragon. Uh, and he's up against these fictional... Uh, fairy tale characters bleating about transgender bathrooms and net zero and they're not living in the real world. Uh, you're quite right about that, James. Uh, a Twitter user says P Putin never had any intention of negotiating. He was just making a show of it and Macron was wasting his time. Putin only understands force. Gareth says, should Neville Chamberlain be given credit for trying to make peace with Hitler? In that case, it may have been more a delaying action, but it also shows there are times when talking is considered counterproductive. Look, you know, uh, it's not the 1930s, and I get a bit tired of these comparisons because it's almost like, oh, history, history, history. Oh, what's the only bit of history I know? Hitler. Uh, well, you know, it, it, in the mid-1930s, when you're only basically a decade and three quarters away, uh, from a world war that slaughtered millions and millions, your, your calculations of these things are different. You know, and I'll, to go back to what I was saying, Neville Chamberlain wasn't uh, talking about pronouns, OK? So he was real. Neville Chamberlain was real in a way that Joe Biden is completely unreal, whatever you think of him. 
Uh, do you know what I like about this new digital world? It's that everyone in it sounds so benign and helpful. Here's a fellow called Neil Palmiter, who until recently was chairman of the Canadian Bankers Association. I have never heard of that, but I assume it's an association of bankers from Canada. Uh, and here he is talking about the need for digital ID. The EU is very big on digital ID. If it sounds a bit scary, don't worry. They've put some soothing new agey music under Mr. Palmiter's words. So it sounds like you're getting a seaweed exfoliation. Digital ID. All of us are living in a digital world, but we're tethered to an analog model of how we identify ourselves. Memorizing countless online passwords, carrying government issued licenses, plastic cards, and more. Digital ID. Gosh, yes, now you mention it. It's such a nuisance having to carry around all these plastic cards. Not like the old days in the Weimar Republic when you could just tootle around with wheelbarrows of cash. I think my, uh, my sciatica's uh, due to uh, walking around with a platinum MasterCard all day long. Have you got anything to cure that? Canada's banks are perfectly situated to help lead the creation of a federated digital ID system between government and the private sector. The World Economic Forum agrees that banks and financial institutions should lead the path forward for digital ID. Banks are high. Ah, so the World Economic Forum, all the Davos jet set with the private planes, agree that banks should lead the path forward to digital ID. Meanwhile, back in the real world, a hacker with close ties to intelligence agencies hacked into Give, Send, Go and then passed on the names of all the donors to those Canadian truckers. Donors from Canada, Britain, all over the Commonwealth, America, Europe, and then Justin Trudeau's Ministry of Pain in turn passed the names along to the banks and the banks froze all those people's accounts. In the old days, it was immensely time consuming and labor intensive for Big Brother to watch you. But with digital ID, we're all signed up for the digital panopticon from birth. What could go wrong? Well, it's all gone wrong for Tom Morazzo. He's a former soldier of the Queen, but that counts for naught when they want to seize your bank accounts. Uh, Tom, you've been uh, very involved in the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa. They have decided, the Canadian state, to turn it into uh, the uh, maple equivalent of January the 6th and punish you guys so that nobody ever tries anything like this again. How's it, how's it going for you? How are you holding up? Yeah, well, that, that's absolutely true. Uh, there, has, uh, there are no warrants for my arrest. There are no charges. I haven't been convicted of anything. And I was, uh, you know, a volunteer in a, in a convoy of freedom that I absolutely believed in. And yet all of my bank accounts with my name on it have been frozen. My credit cards have been canceled. Um, my, my, my spouse's credit rating has been attacked uh, and they've dropped her score 109 points. And they've even um, sent warnings to my, my ex-wife about her assets. Mm -hmm. um, they've left her alone, but the very fact that, you know, anybody with the same last name as me is, is being punished without any form of due process is deeply disturbing. Now, so, uh, with your, with your ex-wife, I take it that this was someone like whoever she banks with, the Royal Bank of Canada or the Bank of Montreal or whoever it is, just wrote, wrote to her and, and said, we're keeping an eye on you, basically. Yeah, that's basically it. Like she, um, she, we're on great terms because we co-parent uh, a child together uh, with a very extensive medical background in history. And um, her financial institution that she deals with, uh, was, they notified her and said, you know, this potentially is going to be coming. We're looking at your assets, basically. They did notify her after and say, okay, we're going to leave you alone. Um, but all of my stuff to to this point in time are still frozen. I check every hour, and um, my assets are still frozen. And and Including how do you cards. get them on? Un... Uh, well, yeah, I yeah, looked you, on my bank. Saying... It said, uh, "Give us a call." It said, "Give us a call at this number," and then you, you can't get through. And I have an appointment apparently on the third of March to talk to somebody at 
um, Bank of Montreal. That's who I, I, I dealt with. And, you know, as soon as my, my accounts are unfrozen, I'll be closing all of my accounts with Bank of Montreal and uh, withdrawing my money and mm. I'll never do business with them again because they were deputized by law enforcement um, with because law enforcement had no legal mechanism to do it. So the banks mm. uh, went in and did it themselves without any due process. And the banks have been given immunity from uh, the government of Canada. Yeah, so you cannot, there's, it's not as if there's a judge who, who has yes. ordered the bank to freeze your accounts. It's basically the bank is doing that. They're taking their orders direct from uh, Justin Trudeau, basically. And you cannot sue. You, you, you've got an appointment on March the 3rd. You're presumably going to be scavenging in garbage cans for dog food uh, and whatever to eat until March the 3rd. And you can't then sue uh, the Bank of Montreal or whoever it is. It, well, it's it's true. I, I'm a few steps away from scavenging for food, but the the really disturbing part is, and I mentioned, um, you know, my my child's extensive uh, health situation. The uh, the credit card that I used to um, buy his uh, much needed medication uh, was cancelled, and my ex wife found that out when the guy came to deliver the medication from the pharmacy last night. And so, you know, it, cash so, is king right now. Yeah. And they're prepared, so, they're basically prepared to make your, your sick kids sicker in order to teach yes. you the lesson of what happens when you uh, disagree with the government. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this, is, this is, there's no due process here at all. No means to defend myself. Um, it's it's disgusting, mm. and, and if if people didn't wake up to the mandate surrounding COVID, my hope is that hey, now when they can attack your your financial assets without any due process, maybe people will start actually waking up in this country and paying attention to at least that part of it, because the Emergency Act that uh, they declared or the War Measures Act was really, in my opinion, mm. was just a a cover story to bring in this this um, the government's ability to attack your financial assets under the cover of a war measures act, and they fully intend and yep. they brag about uh, it on on the media that they they want to keep this power. Yeah. Yeah, they're absolutely serious about that. The the guys on the street, these rogue coppers on the street beating the crap out of little old ladies is in some ways a big distraction. The real power grab here, uh, which, uh, which the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, says she wants to keep for good, is the power of the government just to reach in, take your money, so you can't feed your sick kid, you can't go to the grocery store and buy a loaf of bread, uh, and that's the power they want to uh, keep permanently. This is an uh, absolutely disgraceful power grab, and I don't have any idea why the so-called loyal opposition in Ottawa are being so loyal and so silent about this, or why other prime ministers around the Commonwealth have not actually denounced the behaviour. This is, this is absolutely terrible stuff. Thank you very much, Tom. Good luck to you. We're going to watch Thank what you. happens to you, and we're going to stay on this story. Um, Her Majesty the Queen is presently COVID positive and we wish her all the best. Long may she reign. Long may she reign. Uh, she's currently doing only a bit of so-called light work, uh, which begs the question, what's happening to the heavy work? Well, under the Regency Act, if the Queen's indisposed, there are councillors of state. For example, the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Cambridge. Oh, that sounds OK, fine by me. But what happens if the Duke's in New Zealand? And the prince is in Belize. Oh, well, don't worry. Then it's uh, Prince Harry and Prince Andrew. One of them's just settled a sexual abuse case and the other's no longer resident in Her Majesty's dominions but has embarked on a new life as an Instagram influencer in Malibu or whatever the hell he's doing these days. So why are they still vested with potential executive authority? over this realm. Dickie Arbiter uh, is the Queen's former press secretary and he knows more about this kind of stuff than anybody. Uh, Dickie, you floated this uh, on Twitter the other day. The Queen uh, pays a great attention to detail. 
At the time, she kind of pulled uh, Harry's, his royal highness, away from him. Uh, and at the time, she took away all the uh, honorary colonel-in-chief stuff from Prince Andrew. She must have given a thought to this, mustn't she? Well, it's, uh, it's easier said than done. Um, unfortunately, convention has it that the four male heirs in line to the throne uh, become council of state upon reaching the age of 21. So that means Prince Charles, Prince William, uh, Prince Andrew and Prince Harry. Uh, and it's not that easy to take them away. It would take an act of parliament to take them away. Uh, you mentioned right at the beginning, William in, in New Zealand, uh, Prince Charles in Belize, it won't happen like that. Uh, there won't be two um, mm. uh, councillors of state out of the country at any one time. Uh, we had a slight wobbly uh, a few weeks ago when Prince Charles was tested positive and William was out of the country, but uh, both of them out of the country, it just will not happen. It's easier said than done to remove councillors of state and Parliament's got enough on its hands without... Uh, enacting uh, a removal of uh, both Harry and Andrew. Why couldn't uh, the Prince of Wales just pick up the phone to his son and his brother and say, why don't you do the decent thing and withdraw? I mean, this idea, Prince Harry originally was quitting London to go and serve the Commonwealth. He stuck whatever it was, five weeks in Canada, and then, and then the lure of Hollywood proved too much for him. How, how does he presume uh, to be standing by as, uh, as, as, as a uh, stand-in head of state when he's living the life in California? Interesting you use the word decent thing. Uh, neither have done anything decent. Harry has walked out of the royal family. Um, he, you, you mm. mentioned about him being domiciled in the States, but he signed a lease on Frogmore, which means he's still domiciled in, in the UK. Andrew, well, Andrew's never done the decent thing, has he? Um, it, took, uh, mm. it took his mother to take away all the uh, associations with the military rather than him facing what he mm. is facing, saying, well, you know, for the time being, I will stand down in the same way as Harry should do the decent thing and say, I will stand down. But they just don't do it. They just cling mm. on to what is there in the hope that they will uh, come back again and pick up where they left off. It just won't happen. Well, and the, what's interesting is that the, the two people next in line would be uh, Prince uh, Edward uh, and, uh, and the Princess Royal, who are the very definition of uh, royals who just keep their heads down and rarely make the papers except when they're, you know, cutting a ribbon or pinning a medal on uh, somebody. So they would seem to be perfect for the job. Yeah, they actually make the papers a, a little bit more than just cutting a ribbon and and, and, pit it, uh, uh, mm. and pinning a medal on somebody. That's, uh, that's, mm. that's it really um, cutting down what they really do, and they do a lot of good work. It's not, as, mm. it's not easier said than done, because um, we had the act of Prima Gentia uh, in 2011. Unfortunately, it wasn't backdated. If it had been backdated, then Princess mm. Anne might have been in with a chance, but it wasn't. So um, mm. Prince Edward is way down the pecking order, as is Princess Anne, and that's the reason why um, they cannot be... Uh, uh, included as councillors of state. Although, having said that, in 1952, on the death of King George VI, Queen Mother uh, lost yeah. elig eligibility uh, of councillor of state, and yet she was reinstated by the Queen in 1953, because at the time, Charles and Anne were young, uh, and all there was there was Princess Margaret. So Princess Margaret was already a councillor of state. Queen would be out of the country. So we need two councillors of state. And it happened in 1974, uh, when we all remember, well, you might not, you're too young for that, um, the, uh, uh, the three-day week, uh, and everybody was going on strike. Right, and, right. Uh, it's time to get rid of the parliament. And the Queen Mother did it on behalf of the Queen with the Queen's express permission because she was on tour in New Zealand at the Commonwealth Games, and she obviously couldn't do it. So there is a, a mechanism... But today, the mechanism is through Parliament. As I said a moment ago, Parliament's got enough on its hands without sort of sorting out councillors of state. 
Well, just remind me uh, about that business in 1952, Dickie. Uh, did the Queen unilaterally put the Queen Mum back on the Council of State list, or did that require a vote in Parliament? No, well, the, the Queen Mother lost her position as a Councillor of State on the death mm. of King George VI. She was no longer a Queen Consort. Mm. Uh, by 1953, mm. after the coronation and the Queen was going away on this six month tour of the Commonwealth, there was mm. a need for an additional Council of State because all there was was Princess Anne, uh, Princess Margaret. Uh, mm. and therefore, the Queen Mother mm. was reinstated, which she obviously lost on, on her death in, in 2002. Um, but it's not, as, it's not as easy as that today uh, with uh, trying to reinstate Prince Edward, who lost it in 2005, I think it was, and Princess Anne, who lost it in, in mm. 2003, when both William and Harry turned 21. So it's uh, it's not as simple as well, that. As I said, it is an act of parliament. Well, well, well wait, wait a minute. Uh, you mentioned the Primogeniture Act, or, or whatever it was called, about a decade ago, when they decided to equalise boys and girls in the royal family's yeah. uh, line of yeah. succession. There were a lot of the Queen's realms who, uh, you know, you say it's all uh, a bit complicated legislatively, but there was a lot of uh, there were several in the Queen's realms who basically just said just rubber stamp. They didn't debate it in Parliament. They just rubber stamped it, and it went through in in fifteen minutes. Why couldn't it just be fifteen minutes uh, on this thing? You know, ask Boris Johnson that. Ask Downing Street why they can't uh, debate it in Parliament, because it does need debating in Parliament. It does need uh, parliamentarians to, uh, put in your words, to rubber stamp it. Uh, they've got uh, Putin on their mind. They've got Brexit on their mind. They've got COVID on their mind. They've got the economy on their mind. And they've also got Partygate on their minds. So uh, not a lot of time. Well, uh, I, I take your point, but I think there's something outrageous in the idea of either Prince Harry or Prince Andrew basically having been bounced from the royal family. Uh, even the potential idea that they might come in and be acting king for a couple of days is absolutely obnoxious. You always know more about this than almost anybody else, and it's, uh, and it's great to have your insight. Thank you very much, uh, Dickie Arbiter. When we return, the big money man, Peter Schiff, is here, and you can send me your questions for Stump. Stein. You can email them to gbviews at gbnews or tweet them to at gbnews. That's all straight ahead. Don't go away. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
You may think all this stuff that's going on in Ukraine, wherever the hell on the map that is, is nothing to do with you, but it could actually uh, affect you in your pocket. If you didn't think uh, inflation, which is uh, 7% officially, and I think in the on some of those American charts is uh, upticking toward double figures already. It's only going to make things worse uh, if uh, if uh, the two biggest countries in Europe goes to war, go to war. Peter Schiff says that sanctions against Russia, we're not going to be fighting in Russia, we're not going to take on the Red Army, even the Pentagon aren't that stupid. But Peter Schiff says what we're doing instead of going to war, sanctions will only make inflation worse. And he joins me now. Peter, uh, uh, explain this because people seem to think that Ukraine is just, they've, they've picked a spot, a pinprick on the map to arrange a little distraction from whatever's going on at home. But actually, this, uh, the actions we're taking against Russia are going to make the home front worse. Well, absolutely. You have to remember that inflation is really just another government tax. It's one of the ways that governments pay for spending. They could take our money legitimately uh, through an income tax or a sales tax, or they can just print money. And when they do that, they create inflation. And so the price of everything we buy goes up. And so instead of paying higher prices, we pay, I mean, instead of paying higher taxes, we pay higher prices as well. If we sanction uh, Russia, we're going to end up with larger government deficits. Oil prices are obviously going to end up rising as a result of the sanctions. Uh, Biden has already indicated that he's going to try to offset the impact on consumers. So the government's going to run bigger deficits. So the Fed's going to have to print even more money as a result of the, of the sanctions. And so we're going to get even more inflation and prices are going to rise uh, by an even greater degree. Now, the, the uh, salient point about American debt uh, has been that it's risen in a time of uh, virtually invisible interest rates. So that it's gone, it's gone from, I think, 5 trillion to 30 trillion in a, you know, a nothing period of time. But in that period of time, the, co the cost of borrowing has been zilch, zero. What happens well, sure. to that 30 trillion dollars? Yeah. So what happens to that debt when paying real amounts of interest in it, you know, uh, suddenly becomes a factor? Well, if the U.S. government had to pay real interest, the government would default. Oh, the main reason that interest rates are still so low is because the government can't afford higher interest rates. And of course, ironically, by keeping interest rates so low for so long, the Federal Reserve encouraged an overly indebted U.S. government to go even deeper into debt. Uh, for years, uh, Congress was saying we should take advantage of these low interest rates by borrowing more money. And I kept saying, well, that's like saying, you know, we should take advantage of free heroin by, by, by injecting it. You know, just because something is free doesn't mean you do it. And the risk is always, well, what happens when it's no longer free? What happens when interest rates go up? Because we don't have $30 trillion worth of debt locked up in 30-year Treasury bonds. Most of it is in short-term Treasury bills. Like during the housing bubble, a mm. lot of Americans took out adjustable rate mortgages, so they didn't lock in their low interest rate for 30 years. They had a teaser rate, and when interest rates went up, they could no longer afford to make the mortgage payments, and so they walked away. If the Fed actually raised interest rates sufficiently to fight inflation, there is no way the U.S. government could service the debt, let alone repay it, and it would have to default. Mm. So to prevent the default, we're going to run the presses full steam. Inflation is not going to go away. It's just getting started in the United States, and it's going to get much, much worse. Uh, America is uh, not Greece or Zimbabwe because its currency is the global reserve currency, which is a huge advantage. Um, not only Putin, but Chairman Xi and the Ayatollahs in Tehran. Uh, at some point, they're going to want to yank the rug out from under the dollar, aren't they? Well, especially when we use it as a weapon, when we try to sanction people by, you know, denying Russia 
access to U.S. dollar uh, payment system. Uh, obviously, that doesn't sit well with the Chinese, who are wondering if we might do the same thing to them. But the only reason America has been able to live beyond its means is because of the dollar's reserve mm. status. The only reason we can run these huge uh, budget deficits and trade deficits, the only reason we were able to get away with all this quantitative easing was because the world valued the fiat currency that we created out of thin air. But when they stop valuing it, mm. when they no longer want to stockpile it, when they no longer want to exchange the goods that they produce for the paper that we print, the mm. party is over. We're going to have a sovereign debt crisis, a currency crisis, and the American standard of living is going to plunge because we're going to be forced to live within our means. And unfortunately, those means have been dramatically diminished over the years. On the flip side, this is actually going to be very positive for the rest of the world because they will no longer have the burden of supporting and subsidizing the U.S. economy. The world will be able to consume more of what it produces and invest more of what it saves rather than diverting those resources and those goods to Americans. So uh, your view of this is that this is a uniquely perilous... I mean, you're right in the, uh, in the macro picture. I mean, generally speaking, Denmark and Norway and Sweden tax their peoples for what their governments spend. Uh, in America, in Washington, one political party talks about small government all the time. In fact, it's a big government that's just basically uh, put the debt on its great grandkids' credit cards. But the problem is right. it's, it's going to come to a crisis long before the great grandkids. Well, it's already a crisis. It's a crisis right now. The only reason we were able to kick the can down the road for as long as we did with quantitative easing and stimulus was because we could pretend that inflation was too low. The Federal Reserve kept saying that we don't have enough inflation. It's lower than 2 percent, even though the way they measured it was wrong and that the whole time they were pretending it was below 2 percent, it was well above it. Well, now it, they can't pretend anymore. Inflation is so bad that they can't lie about it. I mean, they can still claim it's seven and a half when it's really 15, but even seven and a half percent is too much. And so they can't do this anymore. And so now they're caught, uh, you know, in this box and there's no way out because they can't fight inflation, but they can't admit that they f can't fight inflation because either way we have a crisis. Yeah, I remember you saying, uh, hearing a speech of yours a couple of years ago, just before the COVID kicked in, in which you were saying, uh, talking about the Dow Jones being worth less than your cufflinks at a certain point. I take it you've kind of advanced the coming of that scenario well, after, the, after what's been going on in the last couple of years. Well, that's because that particular pair of cufflinks was made out of 24 karat gold. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, I mean, I, I do think that the nominal value of those cufflinks will, will, will exceed the, the, the Dow because there's going to be a tremendous amount of inflation. Unfortunately, that's the, uh, the less, uh, you know, that's the viable way out, you know, policy-wise. Of course, I think that's yeah. the worst choice. I think a better choice would be to restructure the debt and admit the truth, but politicians never do that. Uh, they never want to accept responsibility. They always want to uh, blame others. And so we're going to keep on printing money. The government's not going to default. The debt's going to be repudiated through inflation. Holders of U.S. dollars are going to suffer a tremendous loss in the purchasing mm. power of those dollars as the price of goods and services uh, rise dramatically as a result of, of the loss of value of the U.S. dollar. And of course, when the dollar loses its reserve currency status, which I think we're on the cusp of doing yeah. right now, that will simply accelerate uh, the dollar's demise. OK, you heard those words, folks, the dollar's demise. Thank you, Peter. And uh, don't wear those uh, cufflinks when you're <laughs> strolling around the seedy part of town. Uh, let's get to a couple of your questions before we close things. Uh, what do we got here? Uh, what level of influence do you think Obama has over Joe Biden? I don't think anybody has any influence over Joe Biden. He's sleeping in his basement and he's watching reruns of Columbo all day long. And then they bring him upstairs to try and read the prompter for 15 minutes, and he can barely do that. Uh, let's see. That. A Twitter user says, if the government cares so much about our lives, then why are police helicopters government-funded, and yet air ambulance and life 
boats both charity funded. They don't care about your life at all. That's the, that's the mistake you're making. They don't give a hoot about your life. And the RNLI is just a taxi service for illegal immigrants. It's the express check-in. OK, that'll do it for us. Dan Wooden's going to give it some Wednesday welly for two hours, as only he can. The best way to close out your day. Stay safe, stay free. Hello, I'm Luke Mile with your weather forecast. Over the next 24 hours, we've got snow and lightning across Scotland. That's going to be the main feature of our weather. And for all of us, it is going to be turning a lot colder. This cold front is sinking its way southwards across the UK, bringing much colder air. And where we've got this occluded front, that's where we're going to see some frequent and heavy showers with the risk of lightning. So let's take a look at the picture through Wednesday evening. Got some heavy rain on the cold front as it sinks its way through England and Wales. Some lively bursts of rain to come for a time. The colder air is coming in behind, so it's across Scotland and Northern Ireland where the weather warning is in place that we'll see frequent snow showers. We could see as much as 10 to 20 centimetres building up over the hills and mountains of Scotland. Temperatures sub-zero and feeling a lot colder in that wind. And they'll continue through much of the day. Those frequent showers pushing their way in as the rain clears away from southeastern areas. Elsewhere then, brightening up through the day, but further showers will push their way through. There'll be a mixture of rain, sleet, hail and snow across the country. But as I say, the most frequent snow showers likely to be across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Brisk winds as well means blizzards across those mountains. So some tricky conditions here. Temperatures a lot lower than recent days and it stays cold and wintry through the first part of Thursday night. We'll see this another feature coming southwards. So we could see some snow over the Pennines, perhaps North Wales. But later on, into the small hours of Friday, we'll start to see those winds easing down. The skies will clear, showers will tend to become fewer and further between. So a touch of frost first, first thing on Friday morning. Lots of sunshine out there though on Friday morning. Still a few showers in the mix, but they'll be easing their way off into the North Sea. And for most of us, under a ridge of high pressure through Friday, it looks to be a much calmer day. Light winds, temperatures not faring too bad, still on the chilly side. But I think as we go through the day, there'll be plenty of sunshine. And it stays dry across the south. Chance of rain further north over the weekend. Goodbye. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare.